okay <clears throat> we'll pray then we'll get started yeah okay let's pray father god we we thank you lord we thank you for this opportunity to to come to your presence lord uh, intentionally again and again and uh, yes master even this morning lord we do that lord we come to the one who is peace the prince of peace we come to the one who is the king of kings yes lord we draw near to you because you are the lord of lords and uh, we draw near to you because you are the spirit of wisdom and revelation and we thank you lord it's such a privilege awesome privilege for each one of us lord to to draw near to your presence to have access lord uh, to you lord every day every moment father god and master this this even this morning as we draw near father god we pray that um, lord that you would speak to us we pray and ask oh father god that your word will make a difference father god we pray and ask oh master that uh, you would fill us lord uh, with your presence oh father god we pray that you would fill us lord with your power oh master yes father god we pray that um, Lord, even as you fill us with your presence, your power, Lord, I pray for purpose, Lord, to be established in our hearts, Master. We pray for all the good things, Lord, that you have in store, Father God. Lord, let it be established, O oh God. And everything that, Lord, hinders that, Lord, your purpose, your plan, Lord, everything that hinders, O oh God, maybe it's fear, maybe it's, uh, Lord, low self-esteem or anything of that sort, let it be rooted out, Master fear or anxiety lord let it be taken out oh god even as you fill us lord with your presence and with your power yes master come lord we just ask invite you to come and have your way lord have your way in our lives father god have your way master we thank you lord we thank you we come at this time we come at this day we come at these uh, classes lord into your mighty hands we thank you in jesus master's name we pray amen amen okay so um, last class we uh, ended with chapter three, right? Um, First Corinthians chapter three. Okay. So um, so anyone remembers anything from chapter three? What did we learn? Any takeaways? Anything that you can recall from chapter three? Anything that stands out for you in chapter three? Anyone? One one thing that uh, like stood out for you. Um, sorry, sorry. Come. What was that? Uh, Jesus with power. Proclaiming Jesus with power. That is, um, yeah. That I think is in chapter two, right? Yeah. Chapter three also. Yeah, I think that was, hmm, I think that was chapter two, right? Um, Everything uh, what we are doing should be the foundation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus should be the foundation in in every person's life, even as we minister to them. Yeah, that was something. Um, anything else? Ch chapter three. Yeah, go ahead. I think that was Sri Radha only. Uh, online students also. Okay, be careful how we build. Yeah, on the foundation. That's true. Yeah. We saw the unity, like yeah, Apollo is talking about the unity. Like, uh, congregation was like talking about I'm Apollos, I'm Pauls. Mm -hmm. So Paul was teaching about unity. Mm -hmm. About um, yeah, uh, against division. And when there's division, there is carnality. When there's carnality, what is carnality is, uh, you know, division and strife and quarreling. And and Paul says that you know I could not speak to you. I wanted to bring in, you know, spiritually mature teaching. And he says, you know, you are still spiritual babies in Christ, right? Babies in Christ, because because this is what it is. This is the status of your your mindset is. Um, this that there's division, there's strife, everything, right? Yeah. So Nina says we are God's temple. That's right. Collectively, as the people of God, we are the temple of God, and a dwelling place of God. Uh, so that is also, and also we we heard about that warning that you know if anyone defiles this temple, God will destroy. 
right so and it's in line with okay what you what you teach and what you do how you minister to people and so he's saying you know you you make sure that you build with good material he talks about you know gold and silver and precious stones and all that wood and hay and that day will actually determine how you built because if people are you know still holding on if people are still strong and continue uh, then it's fine but if they are not going to continue on in faith then that means that you have not there's something wrong you know deficient in the way you built them so yeah so that's that's something that he says right um, another thing that we that we also saw is that um, the different roles the one who sows the one who waters the one who reaps right so um, in all this he, uh, he talks about the fact that it's it's god who gives the increase and he also says that it is um, we are all god's team right we are uh, we are god's co-workers we are god's colleagues in other words so that's a privilege but also a great responsibility and also to not to compare and not to look down on anyone else you know uh, who's 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 maybe doing a, a role of sowing and maybe you are doing this role of watering and maybe someone else is doing the work of reaping right and maybe there are some you know where you you have the privilege of doing all three like paul did that so the thing is that um, we see that it is it is not good to say that okay the one who sows is greater than the one who waters or the one who reaps is greater than the one who sows or whatever you know we can't compare and we cannot put one person down or you know we can't elevate another person because we are god's co-workers and so why is paul saying all this because this was the situation there in the corinthian church that people were actually being divided on account of god's ministers right they were saying okay i'm of this person i i'm off this person meaning you know i'm i belong to this person or i i find this person better this minister better than the other one you know this minister of god better than the other one and uh, and so to address that you know is is seeing you know this is how god sees right we you are god's uh, he says that right um, you are god's building uh, you are god's field and also he talks about the third picture that he brings about is that you are god's temple right you are god's field you are god's building and you are god's temple so in other words he's saying you actually belong to god we are god's fellow workers but this is how this is this is your identity right so um he he brings that uh, to them he teaches them that okay so, so let's look at chapter 4 today right so chapter 4 um it continues on and he he continues on to say how they should consider apollos and Paul and Cephas and any other servant of God, right? So um, there are four sections that we can uh, divide this chapter. One is that he talks about how they are servants and stewards of God, and he also talks about judging and honoring servants of God. That's chapter verse three onwards, chapter four. Then he talks about the apostleship, right? He says, okay, we are apostles, but these are the challenges of being an apostle. and then he talks about how how should a spiritual father be right so he talks about that in chapter 4 okay so let's look at that first uh, let's look at verses 1 1 and 2 onwards he says let a man so consider us as servants of christ and stewards of the mysteries of god moreover it is required in stewards that one be found faithful okay so servants he uses the word servant one who is subordinate one who is functioning as a free person you know paul uses several words to talk about servants you know born servant and sometimes he says slaves but here he uses the word um uh, hupritis which means that a person who is subordinate who is serving in a, in let's say in a house or somewhere but he is also free that he is not a slave he is not a born servant you know he is free man so he's he's saying okay let us let us con- you consider us as servants you know that we have in other words he's saying okay we are serving the lord willingly you know not not because we are we have to not because uh, you know uh, of any other reason we are serving him willingly right then he says you know let you uh, uh, we are servants of the lord jesus you know servants of christ okay 
and uh, he uses the word uh, steward which means somebody who is an overseer somebody who is a manager right a steward is supposed to manage the resources well a steward is supposed to have the responsibility of looking after guarding something so he's saying okay we are servants of christ and this is how you also need to see us that we are stewards which means we are managers overseers of whatever god has entrusted to us responsibilities that is given to us okay we are stewards of what the mysteries of god so whatever revelation whatever teaching whatever you know understanding that god has entrusted to paul he says i need to be a faithful steward that's what he says in verse 2 right in verse 2 he says it is required in stewards that one be found faithful okay so um so which means that one should be sincere one should be trustworthy you know that is what you know being faithfulness being faithful means that you are sincere uh, there is no you know different motive right in what you're doing uh, and you are also being trustworthy someone who is reliable right someone who is accountable someone who who, who you can depend on so he's saying you know stewards must be faithful it is important it is required this is a requirement okay it's not an option but it's a requirement for stewards to be found faithful so we understand something you know about uh, stewardship and faithfulness in stewardship from you know the parable of the talents right which jesus taught matthew 25 and he talks about that and he says that okay this is how a steward should be that whatever is interested you you better it you increase it yes you guard it but you also you know do something to increase what has been guarded to you what has been given to you right interested to you so um so faithfulness in stewardship and also being a servant so in other words he's saying that when people were giving too much of honor right there is something called uh, the right place of honor for a servant of god right the right place of honor which means you respect you honor them for the work that they do but at the same time you cannot treat them as or we should not treat them as celebrities or we should not put them on a pedestal um as substitutes for god you know sometimes it's it's if we are not careful that can happen right if you're not careful uh, we become dependent we become we even treat them as you know some superstars some celebrities right so that should not be so so he's saying you consider us he's telling the church you know this is how you need to see us you need to see us as servants we are serving god you need to see us as stewards we are overseers of what god has entrusted to us right this is the right perspective that you need to have right and in the previous chapter he talks about this is the, this is how you need to see yourself right that you belong to god you are god's field god's building you are god's temple this is how you need to see yourself right so this is a good thing for us to understand and also for us to uh, put to practice right so because in today's day and time with the social media and everything with a lot of you know the all the sound bites and everything that happens um, it is very possible it's quite possible you know to compare people to to elevate people beyond what is actually required so he's saying you no know, you consider them as servants they are servants of god that's it right okay verse 3 um but with me it is a very small thing that i should be judged by you or by a human court in fact i do not even judge myself for i know of nothing against myself yet i am not justified by this but he who judges me is the lord therefore judge nothing before the time until the lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveals and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from the from god right so he's saying you know he's not concerned he's not worried about how people would judge him right in fact he's saying you know i don't even judge myself i don't evaluate myself so so what is he saying is he saying that you know i live as i want to right i'm not accountable to people i'm not accountable to god no that's not that's not what he's saying he's saying that you know as ministers of god right let the lord judge the motives of our heart right so he's saying that uh, verse 5 judge nothing before the time until the lord comes who will both bring to light who will reveal 
<coughs> what is hidden? Hidden things of darkness, right? Maybe something that is not right, something that is of the enemy. And reveal the counsels of the hearts. I know that word counsels, it means uh, uh, it means will or advice or purpose or motive. Okay, so he's saying, okay, this is this is something the Lord will reveal. Okay. So he's talking about, uh, and then he ends by saying, then each one's praise will come from God. So he's comparing human praise, God's praise. Okay. So he's, what is he saying? Hey, you're judging someone. You're, you're judging a man of God. You're judging a servant. Uh, and you don't know the whole picture, but you're, you know, you're passing some kind of a judgment. And you're saying, that's why you're saying, you know, you're comparing and saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, right? The thing is that God, when when God judges, he knows the motives of the heart. Okay, so another thing that he's saying is that it's it's important that you preach, it's important that you minister and, and do the work of ministry, but it's even more important why you do it right why are you sharing that message why are you ministering in that place why are you addressing that congregation why are you speaking in that meeting you know why are you maybe writing that song why why are you putting it up you know why and with that answer to that question why will reveal the motivation of our hearts why we are doing what we are doing so what we are doing is clear. It's very, it's apparent. Okay, the person is singing a song, they're leading worship, they're, you know, preaching a message, they're doing all this. That is the what. But then there is a why behind the what, meaning, why are we doing that? And that is the motivation of the heart. What motivates us? Is it, is it motivated by, you know, public opinion? Is it motivated by, you know, a, a need for approval need for popularity need for fame need for recognition what motivates us you know sometimes it's not just fully a need for recognition but it's it's mixed with that right one you know part of 50 percent of it is like okay i want to serve god you know this is this is the right thing to do i want to serve him he's done so much for me i want to do this right he's done changed my life so much and i want to do this he's or he's called me into this so i have to do it that is 50 percent of the motive the other 50 percent is like while i'm doing this i want to be known right? i want to be popular i want to be known as someone who who does this i want to be known in this world i want to be known in in this community now that's a mixed motive Right. So he's saying, okay, each one's praise will come from God because he will reveal the motives of the heart. Why did people do what they did? He will reveal it. He knows it. He will reveal it. Right. So he's saying, uh, that is what it is. So this is important. Um, so he's saying, so that is why, you know, I don't judge. The Lord judges me. The Lord judges me. The Lord knows me. And he revealed the motives of my heart. Right. So, and the praise or... Uh, you know, approval for what I did, it, it will come from God because He knows the intents of my heart, right? So that is something that we um, see. So it's not like uh, the motive of ministry, the motive of the servant of God, the mo motive of the stewards of the mysteries of God, very, very important, right? Verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us right, not to think beyond what is written. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Okay, so saying, okay, this is something that I have, I put this together and I'm comparing, you know, transferring figuratively to myself and Apollos. And, uh, and this is what I'd like you to do. You should not, uh, and that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Okay, so what does that mean? That it goes on to say that none of you may be puffed up, or that you become, uh, you know, that you, you know, that you get inflamed with pride, right? Puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Okay, so saying that you cannot be proud. You don't become proud 
because of your association because of your connection because of your relationship with a man or woman of god right you don't you know that you learn this lesson that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written okay so he says this is what it is this is what i have written to you that you consider us as servants that you consider us as stewards so don't think beyond that don't think beyond what i have already described right and uh, uh, don't become proud because of our sakes right don't become proud and and lift up take sides or promote one person over the other don't do that we are unnecessarily dividing the body of christ okay then the second part he goes on to talk about the challenges okay? the challenges of being an apostle okay so obviously you know why why are they proud and why are they you know uh, dividing the church because of one and the other because obviously they see them as celebrities they see them as people who are you know uh, the worthy of this kind of a status or too much of honor and etc then he he actually tells them this is the reality you know he, after sh telling them i am a servant i am a steward he's saying this is the reality of the work that i do okay so he's talking about some of the hardships he's talking about some of the difficulties that they go that he they went through right so let's uh, read that um for who makes you differ from another and what do you have that you did not receive now if you did indeed re receive it why do you boast as if you had not received it you are already full you are already rich you have reigned as kings without us and indeed i could wish you did reign that we also might reign with you for i think that god has displayed us up the apostles last as men condemned to death for we have been made a spectacle to the world both to angels and to men we are fools for christ's sake but you are wise in christ we are weak but you are strong you are distinguished but we are dishonored to the present hour we both hunger and thirst and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless okay look at verse 12 and we labor working with our own hands being reviled we bless being persecuted we endure being defamed we entreat we have been made as the filth of the world the offscouring of all things until now okay, so in these verses he talks about the uh, the reality of the work that, you, that they do the reality of everything that uh, the they as apostles go through the pain okay the struggles the challenges etc okay so um this one second um okay right okay so um so let's look at uh, verses 7 and 8 okay so he's he's saying you know what makes you differ from another because they are comparing because they are uh constantly fighting is saying what is it that how are you different from another person right how are you different from another group why do you say this group is better what makes you different what makes you superior what do you think makes the other group inferior right we are one we are one body in christ so you know why do you do this right so he's asking that question the next question that he asks is what do you have that you did not receive okay in other words he's saying okay, all that you have okay what what do the what do they have as a church you know that's that's what he says in the first chapter itself right when he's addressing them he says he says something right this is who you are as a church this is who you are as a body like he says that you know you come short in no gift you are enriched in everything in all utterances in all knowledge you are enriched okay so he's saying you know what do you have that you did not receive okay in other words he's saying you received it from god as god gave to you right you received by grace you received because of your faith right so what do you have that you did not receive in other words he can, he's saying you cannot boast about anything you know you're calling the other group inferior now you cannot boast about yourselves and say you know this 
I have because of my accomplishments. This I have because of my achievements. And he goes on, you know, um, the John chapter 3, verse 27, where the Lord says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So, so he's saying that you know, this is what it is. You have received it and it has been given to you. So what do you have that you did not receive? In other words, what is it that you achieved that you did not receive by faith? What is it that you have that you did not receive by faith? The obvious answer is, yes, I received all that I have. The gifts and revelations and everything that I have, I received from God. But it's a grace, you know, it's a free gift by grace. And then we ask the third question in verse 7, right? If you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Right? Meaning, yes, you received. It is a gift of grace and right? everything that you have. Now, how, why do you boast as if it is through your own achievements, through your own efforts, to your own accomplishments? Right? The thing is that when we, when we, you know, when we acknowledge that, okay, what I've received, I've received by faith. I've received by grace unmerited favor what the other group or the, what the other person has received it is also by grace so when we have that understanding then you there is humility that we are humble we saying okay i received by grace but other person also god has given and they received by grace so therefore there is no necessity to boast you know there's no necessity to become proud in myself and saying oh you know, i did this and when, they, when you don't become proud, right, then you won't put the other person down. Right? Why do you put the other person down? Because you see that they have something which is different, which is, and maybe they don't have something that you have, right? and you become proud because of it. So he's saying, you know, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? So he asked those three questions. And you know, these are three questions that we can ask ourselves. Right? Um, what makes us differ from another? What is it that I have that I did not receive? And uh, if I receive it, you know, why do I behave as if I've not received it? Right? So he goes on to say, "You are full. You are rich. You reign as kings, and uh, and you know this is this is who you are. God has given you. God has enriched you. God has um, God has already empowered you. Right? He he talks about, and all this has come from God. Has come from the Lord. Right? Verse nine. He says, you know." He says, God has displayed us as apostles, men who are condemned to death. You know, we've been made a spectacle to the world. Uh, we are fools for cause, uh, Christ's sake. We hunger and thirst. You know, this is the physical reality. Right? We, we go through difficulties. We are beaten. We are persecuted. We are homeless. We are, you know, we are, I mean, we are persecuted. We are defamed, you know, false charges. Uh, and also, uh, we are not like popular or anything. We are defamed. We have been made made as a filth of the world, right? So he's saying this is the challenge. This is the reality. Right? And uh, you know, those days it was. I, I would say that it was even even worse, right? Uh, under the Roman uh, uh, under the Roman rule and also the religious persecution that they faced from the from the Jews, right? Jewish community. So so he's saying that you know this is. This is our reality. So this is who we are. This is what we do. Okay, um, and he uses that word right, of scouring, which means that uh, um, it's like uh, you know something that is scraps or something dirt that is rubbed off, um, that is wiped off. Like he's saying we are like dirt, right? and this is how people treat us. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not something that we can be proud of, but this is how it is, right? This is these are the challenges that we go through as apostles. Okay, okay. Then he talks about um, the the father heart that we need to have. Okay, so verse fourteen. Now, why am I writing these things? I'm not writing these things to shame you. Okay, let's read from uh, verse fourteen to twenty one. Okay, I do not write these things to shame you. But as my beloved children, I warn you. Right? And though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, 
who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Okay, so so he's addressing the church again and saying, you know, um, I'm not shaming you. I'm not condemning you. Right? I'm not saying these things to put you to shame. But as my beloved children, I'm warning you. Right? So he's uh, writing to them and he's saying, okay, I need to warn you. And I'm warning you, okay, this is not good for the church. This is not good for you as believers to live like this, to compare like this, to compare men of God like this. Okay? This is the wrong thing to have, wrong attitude to have. Okay? And he says, you know, you are my beloved children, so I have to warn you. Like you might have many instructors and teachers, but not many fathers. Right? So, he's, so what is the difference? like instructors and teachers and fathers, right? The father can also instruct and teach. The father can also lead a person from mature immaturity to maturity. But the, but the father's heart, there is a relationship, right? So unlike a professional teacher or an instructor, uh, there is a relationship. And then, you know, he uses these this word um, to talk about instructors, you know, 10,000 instructors. You know? Those days, the Greeks and Romans, uh, they had some slaves. And their responsibility was to take care of these boys who were growing up. Right? Um, and they were not allowed to step out and, and all that. Um, so these people were supposed to take care, you know, instruct, to be a guardian, to be a guide for these boys as they were growing up. So he uses that, that you know, you may have 10,000 instructors, but you do not have many fathers. Right? And he uses the word, you know, the, uh, the word for a biological father. Right? So what does it mean? It means that uh, spiritual, you know, talking about spiritual father and mother, um, he says, um, in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So, so what happened? He actually preached the gospel. They came to accept the Lord. They became children of God, right? They became born again. And he says, you know, I have begotten you through the gospel in the, in the sense that, you know, as a, a spiritual father. Right? So this is what I have done. And uh, when we when we see that. Uh, he's also talking about Timothy, right? For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. So not a bi biological son, but in the Lord. Spiritually, he is my son. And uh, and so we, we look at what Paul did for Timothy. Right? He found him in Derby, Lystra, and he kind of took him on his missionary journeys. He instructed him, mentored him, right? So this is what he did. He he brought him up to be a minister of God. Okay, now he says, you know, he's my faithful son, beloved son, and he will remind you of my ways in Christ. He will teach you. He will remind you, as I teach everywhere in every church. Okay, so so a spiritual father or mother is not just a person who you know shares the gospel and because of whom we are born again normally we use that you know this person is my spiritual father why because i heard the gospel through the person and therefore i'm born again um well while that may be true right he's he's saying that this is a spiritual father or a spiritual parent who brings someone who matures someone from a place of immaturity to a place of maturity who even has the other person's you know, well-being in mind. Who warns that person? That's that's how he's doing. You know, I'm warning you, as as children, you know, uh, whom I had begotten through the gospel. So, um, so this is a person who actually has the well-being of the spiritual sons and daughters, right? Who who has a relationship, who is interacting, who is well aware of their spiritual progress, who is concerned. So we see all these things 
that Paul is doing, who's even warning, right? So it, it doesn't, um, it means that it's, he's actually urging and treating them, right? So many times we see in today's world that a spiritual father or mother, you know, is demanding taking something out from what whom they call as spiritual sons. You know, this is how you need to do. This is how you need to honor, you know, your spiritual father, your spiritual mother. Now, this is what you need to do financially. You know, this, uh, it's more of an abuse, right? abuse of authority, spiritual authority. Right. So we see that happening. You know, you need to do this. You need to do that. You, know, you need to honor me in this way. And, uh, you know, financially, you need to do this, etc. And it's always, you know, give. There's a lot of demand. You need to, you know, you need to be like this. Well, we, we see the opposite of that in Paul. Right. Paul is saying, you know, this is what I want. I'm, uh, that I'm warning you. You need to change. You need to be transformed and, and so on. Right. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, yeah. So, Pastor, regarding spiritual father. Yeah. Uh, so, if you are seeing, like, not in APC, but other some churches have the assistant pastors. And I hear from some pastors, they were, like, it's kind of like, um, what is it, like, staying with them and okay. learning from them. It's okay. like, um, in our ancient India, they have the Guru Gula. It's, it's like that. The pastors are training okay. in other pastors. Like, okay, you should do like this. You should wash my clothes, etc., etc. So, is it not right? Uh, how to talk to them? Like, in if mm. they are, if you are saying, okay, it's not like that. We are saying this is what you have to do. Mm. But in this scenario, is it's not like that. Yeah. So how to talk to them? Yeah, how to address this whole problem, no? Like, um, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a difficult thing, especially when the, that is the culture, you know, in that church environment, and and everything is. They say, okay, this is how it is; it is accepted. So only the truth will set set them free. You know, that's what the Lord says. You know the truth; the truth will set you free. Which means, uh, uh, one has to know the truth of God's kingdom. One has to know the truth of spiritual fathers and mothers, right? And because of the relationship, yeah, there is a certain, you know, there is a certain requirement or there is a certain, you know, authority that comes. But that authority is not to break the person or to, you know, like he says, you know, we don't have authority over your faith, right? Which means it's not to put them in a prison like situation, lock them up don't have freedom, but is actually to empower the other person to release them. So I think only the truth of God can bring, you know, a revelation of the truth of God um, can bring that because that will only transcend culture or practices. You know, we need to, um, and when God speaks, well, it, it will convict the hearts of people if they are open to it. And they suddenly realize that, hey, I need to actually go beyond this beyond what is what the practices that I'm doing and also from time to time to see you know whatever I'm doing you know is it actually in line with truth is it in line with kingdom values I think one should have that self reflection you know all of us actually you know we might be doing some things because it's effective we might be doing some things because there are results but is it in line with what God wants you know kingdom practice kingdom mindset um, so that's the important thing. So, so in this particular situation, yeah, that's the only thing, you know. Um, and because one cannot force, we cannot. Uh, we can only hope that someone who is uh, who is a friend, who's a, even a mentor to that other person, you know, who's who's a spirit, being a spiritual father, that this person will be open to that, open to receiving counsel. Know. So that's why it's important to ask who does this person look up to, right? In ministry, who does this person um, respect and honor? So that person has definitely a greater, uh, what do you call, access into their lives. So if they say, hey, what you're doing is wrong, um, there are more chances that this person will receive it rather than any other person, you know. So. 
so that's the thing we can pray for that you know who's that person look up to who's that person consider as a mentor and and, and pray and say okay god you know open their eyes let, let them have a, the ones who have access into their lives let them speak yeah that we can okay, there is a question here you know while we mentor young people and we realize god's calling in their lives however they are still um immature i think right i think calling in their lives however they are still immature i think that, um, maybe you you mentioned yeah so is it right to invest in their lives as long as it takes for them to stand on their own before god as long as it may take can we invest much and give on a personal level is there a balance that we ourselves should be mindful of okay so yeah so they are still immature so we are going to invest in their lives uh, and it's going to take time uh, till they you know stand on their feet okay now um so can we invest much can we give on a personal level in the sense okay this is it's going to take some personal sacrifice it's going to take some personal time etc so how long you know is that your question right is there a balance that we should be mindful of okay if you look at you know if you look at the some of these um uh, examples that we see or if we look at the scripture um even in the book of acts you know we've been studying on sundays in church and we see that okay Paul spent this time. You know, there were certain places where he spent years. There were certain places where he spent spent months, right? And he remained in contact with some of the people, not with all, right? So, with Timothy, again, we see. You know, we he went to Derby. He heard about Timothy, and there was something that God brought that divine connection, brought about that divine connection. Whether whether it's with Timothy or Titus or you know others. there was this divine connection that god brought about and when that happened yes he was pouring into their lives um and uh, and i'm sure you know they had their moments of weaknesses immaturities and teaching moments and corrections and all that so paul did that and also they were part of the team so he they could see paul you know they could see his uh, even is uh, you know is uh limitations and and all that negative things and everything that he they saw that they learned they learned how to do they learned how not to do all that happened right so he did that right now did he do that with everyone no right did he do that with the few yes right so um yeah for us to understand it's going to take some time it's going to take some uh, personal sacrifice also right and uh, that's the reality of it right so um so when it comes to when you're asking is there a balance that we should be mindful of in the sense so what your your question i uh, you can just correct me what your question is now how much and uh, what should be the limits right how much can i do how much can i invest uh, and what should be the limits okay so there is a difference between you know our parenting when it comes to you know physical or in the natural and biological there is a line between the physical or the natural and the spiritual so we need to understand that while we are you know uh, being parents spiritual fathers spiritual mothers there is a line there is a boundary between the natural and the spiritual now um, natural uh, you know in a natural setting in a natural family yes the person is with you and you know you have certain access into their lives they have certain rights into your lives all that but this is a this is a spiritual fathering and so the same cannot be taken into this right so which means that um, yeah, you know uh, as a as a natural parent the kind of authority that you might have over your natural uh, children you cannot have the same thing with the spiritual parent or spiritual child right um whom you are so we need to understand that right and um well you can also look at uh, the kingdom builders kingdom builders is this semester or you've already finished kingdom already done yeah if you if you actually go through the paul and timothy you know the exam the, the relationship you know that's a good place to go and see okay uh, what can we do and what is it that what are the boundaries that we should be aware of um you can actually refer to that also you know that will have more input specifics are there right? you can check them yeah okay okay so um 
so paul also you know he he says um, okay, from from the, from this whole interactions and from what he we see we see that uh, he sets the example he says you know you imitate me okay right you imitate me he says um verse 16 therefore i urge you imitate me you know as the spiritual father you imitate me so which means that he's also living an above reproach life as much as possible right he's living an above above reproach life um when i say above reproach which means that people cannot point fingers um and say you know and say okay this guy is failing in this area this guy is failing in that area as much as possible you know uh, he's is living an above above reproach life and is and therefore he's saying with all humility i urge you imitate me right so several things that we understand that our life speaks okay as a spiritual father as a person who was bringing per person to spiritual maturity our life should speak right it's sometimes we think okay it's it's when we sit and formally instruct people formally teach yes they have their place but above all that your life should speak right so that's why you know he's saying i urge you imitate me right whatever i've done however i've lived whatever i've said imitate me right and it's a it's a statement of humility not a statement of arrogance right not not to state boastful statement is a statement of humility he's saying imitate me right and he's saying okay for this reason i've sent timothy to you is is this is talking about the kind of relationship that he has with timothy he says my beloved and faithful son in the lord what is he what will he do he will remind you of my ways right and what i teach he will remind you okay okay verse 18 says uh, now some are puffed up puffed up meaning some are proud as though i were not coming to you so which means they are proud they are not listening they are not listening to any instruction he says you know if the lord wills i will i will know i will come to you if the lord wills and i will know the word not the word of those but the power okay the kingdom of god is not in word but in power so he's is talking again again is bringing about the, that revelation that truth that the kingdom of god when he's saying word he's not talking about the word of god right he's talking about just explanations and mere words that we use and he's saying the kingdom of god is not in word but in power okay so so he's saying i will know the power of those who are getting puffed up and uh, you know it's not just the mere word and he asked that question you know what do you want shall i come to you with the rod or in love or a spirit of gentleness okay so um so some of the things that we we see here uh, in chapter 4 is this you know these four sections that we see um is talking about okay how you should look at or how you should consider a man of god a woman of god and how one should consider oneself and also is talking about the reality of the apostolic ministry that it's not like all glossy and it's not all you know like uh, uh, you know it's not like a celebrity life or anything but it's a very difficult it is the reality is this dangerous Uh, persecution troubles etc and is uh, again talking about spiritual fathering right uh, so uh, and because of that heart is saying i'm warning you right and uh, we learn something about uh, what paul is saying you know you look at my life you know did i live like this you look at my life my speech my actions did you see that i did i ever do that in other words he is asking you know did i ever elevate someone did i ever have strife or division or compare myself with another one put another person down did i do that right so i urge you imitate me right look at me and this is what a spiritual father does so you know do this right okay so we'll stop here uh at the end of chapter 4 um, and then we'll take a break and come back and if there are any further questions uh, we can address that right okay